This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Uh, sources. Yeah. Well, how do you know about the past? What has the past left us today? How do you know accurately? How do you it's know so it easy to be confused. That's right. Yeah. It's very complicated, and you have, to, you have to be able to interrogate your sources intelligently. Yeah. You have to be able to ask, is this an honest source? And if it's not, if it's a complete piece of fiction, what does it still teach us? The duties of a, a citizen. <laughs> That's what it is. Well, right? yeah, it's a, I think that that level of critical thinking is the way where history bleeds into the liberal, liberal arts generally and gets you uh, an informed and educated citizenry that's capable of running a democracy. Oh <clears throat> that's it. We're done now. Okay. No, that's Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Marillo. Uh, he's a professor at Wabash College, a history professor there, and we are so delighted to have him here. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, ed education. Um, uh, let's see. What are we calling this? Education. Education matters, and uh, we are delighted to have him here to talk about history to talk about war, because he's written about that, um, to talk about mm, you know, the development of humanity as a species. You're going to learn about all these things in 28 minutes and 30 seconds. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you for having me on the show, Jay. No pressure. So delightful to be here. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all. Hey, I wore my best shirt. So <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, let's talk about you know, the, the, the thing at Wabash was, uh, let's see, <clears throat> we want to Make our own historians. Yeah, make all our students their own historians. Yeah, what, what a great idea, what a great notion in the history department anyway. But what is the, the, the historian that you want to make? We want to make historians who are critical about sources, critical about the information that has come to us from the past, so that when they construct a past, which is what historians do. We don't uncover something that's just there. We, we, we kind of invent the, the version of the past that we need um, based on the sources. So you have to be able to intelligently interrogate sources, ask if they're honest, ask if what they're really telling you, who were they written for. Um, and if you do all of that, you'll come up with a, uh, a reasonable answer to a question about what happened in the past. And now, question why do you want to learn about the past is uh, kind of implicit in there and well, I th why because I think we can uh, is learn a better life hmm? is it a better life or would I be wanting to learn about the past for the benefit of the species <laughs> wow that's big terms <laughs> um, yeah for the benefit of the species I think we need to know where we came from and what the dynamics of world history have been my specialty is world history at a really big level, and I think um, that knowing how that has, uh, how the modern world has come about, uh, has benefits in terms of intelligent policy making. So, how do you find this generation of history students? You know, I mean, um, Harvard uh, for your AB in history, uh, and then um, Oxford for yeah. more for a PhD That's in history. Right. Uh, this makes you different than most mortals, <laughs> and you, certainly you see the world differently. Super and historian. If, if, you were, if, you, if you were in Boston at the time of the explosion, okay, a, a marathon explosion, right. and you were standing a couple blocks away, you'd see that through the, the prism, the lens of your historical training and your you know, way of looking at things as, a, as an historian. Right. Um, so we, we know generally, well, I'm, you have to tell me how you would react to that, how you would see that. You know, putting it in the context of the entire human species experience versus somebody who had no history, who didn't have any context, and he saw that same explosion. Right. He would see it differently. Can you tell me the difference between the two perceptions? Well, first let me start by saying that there'd be a considerable overlap. I, okay. Historians are still human, <laughs> and I would see that and be horrified and have sympathy for the people who are injured and killed and... All that sort of stuff. So the, the human reaction is always there. Uh, I think I might be more inclined to ask uh, questions about why this is happening in terms of global movements of people, uh, political ideologies traveling across the global network, um, things like that. Uh, uh, context. Historians want context. They no, no event stands on its own. Uh, and causation is always a complex thing. You want to look at 
individual motivations, but individual motivations are set in social structures and economic incentives and cultural constructs that are all interlinked. And this is what I try and do with history is, is make all that complexity more comprehensible by, I do models. I, I, I what's, think what's a model for this discussion? A model for this discussion is uh, I, I do history in terms of networks, which are global systems of connection, often economic, but also cultural and the movement of people and so forth. Hierarchies, which is what we usually think of as states, empires, uh, the, the, or, the political organizations that people live in that organize their own communities. And that divide them as well. And that divide them, indeed. Uh, networks tend to connect, hierarchies tend to divide. So there's a natural tension between those two sorts of structures that is, I think, one of the central stories of world history, mm. that over the millennia, networks have become relatively much more powerful compared to uh, hierarchies. They've both become more powerful. Modern technology makes any modern state, many, any post-industrial state, much more powerful, able to do things than any pre-industrial state. Uh, but relative to each other, networks have become more important. Yeah, maybe this is oversimplifying, but I see a network as a horizontal that is construct correct. and, a, and a, a hierarchy as a vertical. And, and if you think of the sort of people who live in a horizontal construct versus the sort of people who live in a vertical construct, they've got different outlooks on the world. Yeah. They've got different sort of cultural assumptions about how you deal with people. We're moving to horizontal, aren't we? Tell me we are. I, well, because of the increasing power of networks, yes. We've, yeah. I think the, the globe has become more horizontal than vertical, uh, especially compared to 200 uh, years ago and before, before industrialization. I mean, this is why modern democracy is a phenomenon of the modern industrial world, that the ethos of equality and of dealing with each other uh, on that level rather than a sort of Confucian or pick your uh, traditional uh, ethic where you're subservient to your superiors, bow to them, and uh, your superiors command and you obey, and you owe each other respect, maybe. Not always. <laughs> Sometimes but, you're in the lion's pit. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah, I'm not sure what kind of gladiator would respect the Roman emperors, but they'd be obeying for, you know, whether they wanted to or not. So, um, you know, I, I take it from what you say. I mean, I, I, would, I would add my thought that, that, that being in a horizontal world is a better place. It's actually a better state of humanity, do you think? I think so. I think egalitarianism is an important value. So, uh, I think it makes it more possible to treat everybody equally, to think about being able to treat everybody equally, equal opportunity economically, uh, equal value as a human being. That's not e even traditional ethical systems that respected people, respected them in terms of some people were better than others, yeah. more powerful. And so this is a, that's, bag, that's baggage we don't really need. I agree with you. So, but, uh, you know, but, but a horizontal condition, a horizontal character configuration of humanity, it's not a guarantee, is it? I mean, it's a, it's, we, we got there only through a lot of trouble and toil and, and, right. and fits and starts and trial and error. And, and if we can hold on to it, it's great. It's like, it's like um, uh, Franklin. Ben Franklin is coming out of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, or my old thing. Okay, and the woman waiting for him, it's his big secret. She says, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government are we going to have? And he says, Madam, we're going to have a republic if you can keep it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you, know, you will have the kind of government that you deserve. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's I, the same thing with horizontal. You've got to work to keep it, no? That's right. That's right. It, it, it's a product of individuals doing things that benefit themselves on a, on, within structures that encourage that. It's not automatic. It's, I mean, it is, I mean, there's still a very strong tendency towards hierarchy, towards exclusiveness. This is one of the great battles of modern politics. Is, yeah, well, I mean, is, when you say you modern politics, I mean the Trump administration. I right? mean the Trump administration and other right-wing na ethnic nationalist administrations in Europe. Yeah. They, they want to divide themselves off, and that's often, I don't want to attribute that to the people as a whole, because it's often a matter of demagogic leaders who are taking advantage of conflicts that arise to enhance their own power. Uh, I, I, but that, again, 
emphasizes that sort of verticality and that we have leaders who will make us safe, that only I can fix it is a very hierarchy kind of non-egalitarian and, and history plane. has shown that doesn't work. History has shown that that doesn't work, although it, history also shows that in pre-industrial conditions, when communications are slow and there's not a lot of wealth, that it's the only sort of uh, government that uh, works effectively. It's a modern democracy is a product of our being rich and our being uh, ha having modern communication systems. I mean, imagine trying to run a popular vote in the Roman Empire. Yeah. You just can't do it. By yeah. the time you decide something, the crisis has passed, the Persians are at the gates and whatever, you know, it's like, um, uh, so one lesson for that in terms of our current situation uh, is global climate change. If we screw things up enough, pardon my language there, um, as, as to seriously reduce uh, our wealth creation capacity and mess up global communications, you're undermining the conditions on which egalitarianism, democracy, and all our modern values are built. And you're undermining the species in general. Because if we have yeah. those natural disasters, those extreme weather, which you've seen so much of it even recently, and next year is El Nino, it's going to be worse. That's right. Um, we're, we're, people are going to die possibly by the carload uh, because of this. In direct ways and in indirect yeah. ways. As a big, when I flew here from the mainland, I was stunned when I looked down at San Francisco where we were taking off that that's not cloud cover, that's smoke down there. And inhaling smoke is not good for humans, <laughs> you know, and, and there's vast areas of the country that are being affected by the, the haze of monstrous uh, forest fires. So you mentioned, uh, you know, in, in the context of um, uh, two people, one an historian, one not an historian, observing the same scenario. And uh, part of the difference for the, for the historian is that he looks back, he sees causation. Yeah. He's, he understands the continuum, maybe all the way back. I mean, I suppose the perfect answer, the perfect uh, perception would be all the way back to the very beginning of, of life in the, in the cave. <laughs> he, he, he sees all of that sweeping up right there to Boston and the bomb in Boston. And he, and he puts all that together in a nanosecond and he understands. So. But you, but you said causation, and that really fascinates me. Yeah. Because if you can understand causation from way back when till now, then, then you're a um, student of causation is what you are. And you can see this event, this explosion in Boston at the marathon, you can see that as causation for other things, That's right? That's right. It becomes a piece of a much larger painting on the wall that you're just seeing the little bits of. And as you study the painting, you become part of it. This is if oh, the world, wow. if the world, if world history is this great sort of mural, um, you can't help but uh, become part of what you're looking at, and then you're looking at yourself. Okay, you know? that's, that's that's point two on the final exam. The first part, <laughs> we all have to become historians. There will to be, be good a citizens. quiz. Yeah, right. <laughs> Short answer. And the other is, you're you're part of it. You bugger, you're that's part right. of it. You can't escape. That's right. That's right. Even asking questions of the past, um, it doesn't change the past, but it changes our view of the past, and that can be politically important. Now, I will say, so as not to claim too much credit just for history, that. It's the sort of questions uh, that any good liberally educated person who's studied the humanities and the social sciences and sciences should be able to ask. It's just that history has this particular focus on events in the time stream yeah. and how, yes, obviously that any one event then becomes, is not just effect, but cause for future. Is there, is there a limitation on categories of events that you would consider? As an historian, for example, I mean, government. Government mm -hmm. moves, leadership, um, government, government initiatives. Uh, that would definitely be part of it. I suppose social changes, uh, literature would be part of it. Yep. Um, gee whiz, uh, uh, technological changes, that would be part of it. Yep. So, uh, but so is there any limit on that? Is it, or is no. it everything? Oh, it's everything. Is the question is, how do you divide it up? How do you make it comprehensible? And my model has not just networks and hierarchies, but also what I call 
cultural screens where people project images about themselves, and that's what people, how they identify themselves and so forth, and the cultural frames within which those um, uh, images are, are projected. And that's one of the things that differentiates different uh, societies is what are their screen images, but even more, what are their frame values? Yeah. What do they think is the, the natural way to view the world? Yeah. And there's no natural way is to view there, the world. Is their rationality the same as my rationality? And often it isn't. This is one of the things you learn studying military history is that even in something that seems as straightforward in terms of rationality, well, we want to beat the other side. What's the best way to do that? Thinking of who's the other side, what does beating mean, all that sort of thing uh, is, is. Even then, there'll be multiple choices. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's all subject to cultural construction. So before we go to military, we go to military right after the break. Okay. I really want to ask you about that. Um, the, the final question I have for you, at least in this part of the show, is this. So you have these students, and you're teaching them because you really enjoy teaching them. I do. And um, you know, telling them ab about this continuum and this this complex world all around us, and putting them as a as a, a you know a part of it, making them part of of global history. Right. Okay. Are they taking the message? Because we need them to. Am I right? Yep. We need them to understand that to be the next generation of leaders of good citizens, right. the next generation of people who are going to save the planet environmentally, for example, mm -hmm. um, are they getting it? I think so. Uh, I'd be a failure as a teacher if I thought they totally weren't. Yeah, yeah. You're <laughs> um, biased. And, yeah, I am biased. <laughs> I, of course I'm succeeding. <laughs> um, but I get evidence of this at least uh, at the end of each school year when I've taught in the fall semester, History 101, which goes to 1500, and then History 102, which goes to the present. And they've, at least in History 102, they've looked at the last 500 years of history. And I, I divide them into groups and have them do a sort of project. And they get to pick a current uh, world event or, or issue oh, and analyze it from the perspective of the model. And I think they do a pretty good job of seeing uh, the dynamics of these things and how they fit together and analyze them critically. And I, I've had plenty of students say that this has affected how they read the news and what they see in the world today. I didn't tell you this before, Stephen, but I've monitored in American history. Ah, so right. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> except American history is current, uh, current events. Current events, yeah. <laughs> For a medievalist like myself. <laughs> okay, we're going back to medieval right after this break. We're going to talk about war. You like war, don't you? We're going to study war right after this break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king come banging on your chest. You can be the world. You can be the war. You could talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up. You can beat the clock. You can move a mountain. You can break rocks. You can be a master. Don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. It's the 19th, but now it's Ever since sometime in the 19th, it's been creeping back in. Oh, it's okay. It depends if, if they're not people, if they're not humans, you can torture them. Right. And so you make that hierarchical thing yeah. and uh, marginalize them. Okay, this is, a, this is a, a, the frameworks of world history. S Stephen, what is that? That is the cover of volume one. So uh, it's a gorgeous photograph I found of uh, the restoration of various statues that I thought gave a sense of the classical world, but we've got a couple of... Uh, Asian work, modern Asian workers working among it. Uh, I like the picture. Uh, you can interpret the way you want. I kind of like it as here's modern workers working on history, uh, and we're making wonderful, making wonderful, history. Wonderful, wonderful. Right. So was it 800, 900 pages? What? Uh, gosh, I can't tell you. No, it's not that You're long. Not supposed to the, know, actually. Both volumes uh, put together uh, are about between 400 and 500. Okay. So it's two, two, 250 pages per volume. So, I mean, just, just for our listening audience, uh, 
Could you summarize both volumes in you know, 50 words? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll try, though. Um, so volume one is uh, the spread of the human species and their building up of various structures like states and empires and the increasing contact among them down to 1500 when uh, up to that point, states and hierarchies kind of have the upper hand. And then around 1500, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean uh, blue. Yeah, the go. global network gets bigger, uh, gets more powerful. Everybody's communicating with each other more. There's more out of their silos. The, yeah, they're out of their silos. There's yeah. more cultural ex interaction, uh, exchange, conflict, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and uh, the story then is the world coming more together. Uh, you, can, you can read this in linguistic terms that down to about 1500 the number of languages in the world was increasing pretty steadily because you take any group of people and put them in a big enough place parts of them will start speaking different languages. Since 1500 the number of languages has declined. That's so interesting. That is really interesting. So, um, you know, I'm just um, um, uh, talking about that period of time and the break off between the old world, if you will, yeah. and the new world at 1500. There's a, a kind of dispute uh, in, in the schools today about that. Can you describe that? Yes, sure. Uh, the people who uh, administer the AP tests, uh, advanced placement tests that give college credit to high school uh, students for what they study, have been worried about the world history AP test, which attempted to cover the entire you know, from the cooling of the earth to the warming of the earth, as someone once put it, um, in, in one course. And the students didn't like it. It was too, it was too much. Uh, the teachers didn't like it. They didn't know how to teach it. Uh, ETS doesn't like it. But their solution was to say that the AP test will run from about 1450 to the present. And the entire professional historical uh, world that does world history hates that thinks it's a terrible idea. And it is a terrible Why? idea. Because starting at 1450, you lose too much of the vital background. For One of the things that world history is good for is showing you the evolution of cultural differences and the, the many, many ways that people can organize their lives and their cultures and where, again, if you're looking at the, the past for how did we get here today, you're not going to find the answer. And, if you, and it feeds in from previous eras. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, you've got, what, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on and so forth. And you say, what's the history of me? Well, I'm just going to go back to my four grandparents. Wrong. Yeah, you're not going to get the full story. Yeah. Um, and I think the problem is that there is so much to teach at the conventional level that world history is taught that it's, it's like you've got an entire story on the wall and you've got a picture frame that can only take in part of it at a time. So I said, this is the part of it that we're going to take. <clears throat> My solution is to draw the camera back, wider angle lens, uh, raise the level of abstraction. One of the things my model allows me to do in the textbook is to say, well, world history isn't about all the details. It's about these patterns of networks, hierarchies, and culture and how they have changed over time and what the, what the big picture dynamics are. Mm -hmm. I think you could actually do all of world history in one semester. I know people who do it using my book. Um, uh, well, this is, this it, is going it, to build students. I mean, I, I'm after this point. I mean, it's going to build students who are better citizens. It's going to build students who have a better perception of where we are on the continuum. And you, therefore, so. use better critical thinking in order to examine what is happening and what should happen and try to change it. I hope so. That's the, that's the idea, again, not just of history, but of a good liberal arts education, is make you a critical thinker and a more engaged citizen. Um, and there's, you know, not just history, the science has a crucial role to play there, the humanities have a crucial role to play there. It's across the board, but at least for the, for the historical piece of it, Yes, this is designed to teach students why is the world the way it is today? What are the really fundamental features? Where is it going? And what can you do yeah. to be a productive part of this? Yeah. So, um, and I don't mean productive in economic terms. I mean in citizenship terms. Right, because, because ultimately it's the citizens who determine how the 
the government works. That's right. Or it should, anyway. Yeah. So uh, I guess I'm interested in knowing um, whether um, it should be, whether it is or should be a required course. When I went to school, it was required, and, and, and I told you I minored in American history, yeah. uh, although that's only current events. <laughs> <laughs> American history is fascinating history. <laughs> but you know, should it be required? How much of it should be required? That's a really good question, and I come at it from a slightly odd position. Wabash is a very small little liberal arts college. It only has 900 students. They're all male. We're one of the three remaining all-male colleges in the U.S., um, and world history is not required. Uh, no history course is required in the Wabash curriculum. The history, philosophy, and religion are part of a group where you have to take at least one or two courses mm. from that grouping. Uh, and history is fairly popular, major and popular as a distribution requirement. So it kind of comes out in the wash for us that it's not required, but enough people take it. Um, should it be re a required course? That's a complicated question. I know, because, because some, the, the trend in education is not to require a lot of things. That's right, and part of that the, is... The, the, the flexibility. Yep, yeah, and part of that is, yes, student flexibility, student choice to construct their own curriculum. And it's also true, unfortunately, just psychologically, you require a course, people hate it. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, 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 academic uh, freedom. Yeah, academic freedom. <laughs> if, if, if you say, oh, I'm in here because I want to, you get more engaged in the course. <laughs> and I've really always had the luxury <laughs> of dealing with a student body that is, that is there voluntarily. We only have a couple of minutes left. Sure. Stephen and I, and I want to get to the promised point, that is war. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, war, is it, is it an essential part? This is a, an anthropological question, I suppose. Right. Is it an essential part of, of the species? Do we have to make war? Do we have to be, you know, they say that humans are the only species that actually kill other humans. It, uh, I mean, here's for, my answer to that. Okay. And uh, it comes straight out of deep, long standing anthropological debates, debates within the discipline of anthropology. No, I don't think it is. I think it's a, it has in large part been a product of the invention of agriculture and sedentary societies. I think before about 12,000 BC, there was conflict, there was interpersonal violence, there, there was certainly the potential uh, for uh, groups organizing and attacking each other and defending against each other, but it was not endemic, it was not a constant part of human politics. I think it's a product of hierarchical societies and uh, the same conditions mm. that produced agriculture. Well, uh, it, it just goes, uh, this goes to the predict predictability issue now. Yeah. We know there have been wars on a re regular basis throughout. Oh, and, and ever still, since then, it's uh, been endemic. Yeah, you can't at, escape it. At any given moment in time, and, or in this moment included, and maybe even special this moment, we seem to have a lot of strife and, and violence yeah. around the world, sometimes really senseless, with oh. nobody winning, everybody losing. Yep. But, uh, you know, I guess the, the question I put to you is, as, a, as an historian, if you study it from way back when to the, the, the cave, um, you can figure out, can't you, when it is more likely to happen and when it is less likely to happen? Theoretically, you can do that. <laughs> the problem is, like any human phenomenon, war is so complicated and there's so many exceptions and conditions under which it can happen, reasons for it to happen that include politics, but that's our particular sort of modern view of why wars happen. It also happens because of cultural reasons, because of uh, economic reasons, that it's really hard to predict ex exactly. Now, in big picture terms, I, again, I'll come back to uh, a couple of big pieces of the model. Network activity, that horizontal exchange and uh, economic engagement with each other. Trade. Trade reduces war. Tariffs. Tariffs increase war. Increase the possibility. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, so net networks do not produce war as much as hierarchies do. So the stronger networks, global networks become theoretically the less conflict you should see. Now the problem is the leaders of individual hierarchies might see that and put in tariffs to trump, trump up, so to speak, trade wars that uh, would, would 
raise the possibility of conflict again. And I'll come back to, again to, to the sort of climate change problem that if there's a sudden decrease in our ability to produce resources, scarcity, uh, scarcity then conflict will almost inevitably go up. And democracy will go down, frankly. So if, I, if I'm a strong personality, as he is, and, mm -hmm. and others in our last hundred years have been, um, do you think I could go out of my way and actually create a war all by myself? Oh, yeah, that's just far too easy to do. You, you can create the conditions in which w wars will happen. Uh, uh, I mean, there are institutions for doing that, unfortunately. So it's, it is a possibility, and it's one that I think in a functioning democracy, we would, should be very alert to and on guard against. Mm. We talked about uh, Barbara Tuckman and the guns of August, uh, yep. uh, all the factors and events and planning that led up to, uh, you know, World, World War I, One, with, with the notion this will be the, the third question on the exam. <laughs> <laughs> if you plan a war and spend all your time planning a war, what happens? You, you get war. war. Yeah, if all your contingencies are, oh, well, we'll fight the war this way, you're going to fight the war one way or another. That's unfortunately true, and World War I is a great example. Of and that. before World War II, there were indicia that, you know, hither and yon, and it was a networking thing, but it was also hierarchical, and you, you could see that there were indicia leading to the winds of war. And, yeah. and so... Uh, now, and I would, I would say World War II, the indicia were a little more personal. I mean, you had Hitler. Uh, yeah. that, that was one major uh, indication that war was going to come. Yeah. World War I was senseless. The major combatants in World War I did not need to fight each other. They did themselves tremendous damage by fighting each other, uh, and they undermined their position in the larger world by fighting each other. It was stupid. No benefit. Uh, yeah. No benefit. So, taking everything we've talked about, Stephen, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything from the beginning of it, it all. Okay, yeah, okay, and putting it in, you know, in the, in the final basket of the final question here, yep. where, war, where are we, you know, in terms of the indicia of war on the continuum of the species right now under this administration with the events happening globally? I would say we are at a very sensitive moment where almost anything could happen. Again, climate change is one of the crucial things there. We may already have missed the best chance to reduce the, the seriousness of its impact. Um, we're at a moment where the, re, where the nationalist, ethnic nationalist reaction against global network activity is at its height. Uh, which way that goes, even without the, the conditions of climate change, is in the balance. And I think we all have a role to play in trying to make sure that it follows the peaceful path, the path of all everybody respecting each other and thinking of human rights as, a, as central to the modern world. Now that's not part of the exam. But you better remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Stephen. You're Stephen quite Marlo, welcome. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me on the show, Jay. It's been fun. <laughs> Same.